I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, I'll try first not to bore you to death with some statistics on the housing market. I think it's worth at least going over a few numbers just to understand how we got in a situation so dire that a couple of firms that survived the Great Depression couldn't survive a credit crisis and a, and a housing market collapse. Uh, I'm then going to talk about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which I think is a really important policy issue we are going to face in the next few years and really should be on the top of the next president's agenda. Um, that may not interest it. No one from Wharton ever wants to go work there, and you really won't want to now that they're part of the Treasury. Um, but we're talking a $5 trillion business platform, and it's really important how we work that out. And last but least, um, I'm, I think one of my roles today is as the pessimist compared to to Jeremy, I don't think we're out of the water yet, um, partly because I still think we have a ways to go on housing, and also because I think there are emerging problems on the commercial side of real estate that are going to stress the banking sector a bit further. So with that, get on your meds, um, and we'll, we'll go from, from there. Okay, the housing boom, Jeremy called it a bubble, I think. We don't have really good models of bubbles, but I think that's accurate. Um, from 2000 to 2006, real housing prices after inflation rose by 45%. It's a 6.4% real compound annual rate. In nominal terms, housing prices nationwide doubled since 1995. If you look over multi-decade periods, a normal real appreciation rate for homes would be between 1% and 1.5%. So what we saw this this new decade was three to four times the norm, and it's hard to come up with a rational reason to explain that behavior. Nothing, nothing changed by that much. So one, we had one heck of a boom, and it lasted a long, long time. Whenever you see a boom like that, I can assure you that no matter what the property sector, if prices go up far enough and banks are willing to lend, developers will oversupply the market, and that is exactly what happened in housing. I will not bore you with those numbers, but basically in 2004, 2005, and 2006, the number of housing units was grossly in excess of true demographic need, need to replace worn out stock um, and, and the like. Unfortunately, in 2007, there was very little whittling down of that excess supply, which brings us to, to this year. It, permits fell a lot in 2007, but completions didn't. Okay, you know, we basically completed about the right number of, of homes if we didn't have excess supply, which has helped cause this, the beginnings of a real price collapse in housing that we see now. My estimates are this thing will the excess supply will wear off by the end of 2009, but not before. So 2009 is a pretty tough year. I think that's part of why Fannie and Freddie went under and part of why the prices on the mortgage-backed securities the investment banks had to mark were so low because the sort of the end of this debacle keeps getting put off and, and, and put off. Beyond overbuilding, which is going to be cured, um, in another year to 18 months, I think. Um, we also dramatically lowered credit quality for home buyers. Um, a little history is instructive here. Um, in 1940, it's the first census of housing, and 42 to 43% of American households owned. We were coming out of the Great Depression. Um, 20 years later, in 1960, after the Second World War and a great rise in wealth in the 1950s, just under 60% of households owned. Over the next 30 years, that number rose to about 63%. So in 30 years, you got a three percentage point rise in the home ownership rate, and just really marginal increases. And then roughly from 1988 to 08, we had a six percentage point rise in the home ownership rate. And who was that among? It was among you, the young and other sort of high risk, less good credit quality borrowers. And we set up a big industry in mortgage finance to service those folks. And it's what I call the non-prime market. And the non-prime is what Jeremy noted is the subprime market. Think of that as people with impaired credit. In technical terms, they have low FICO scores. And subprime borrowers tend to be in the bottom third of the distribution of people on this credit score quality. Then Alt-A, 
um, that Jeremy also mentioned. Think of this as low documentation loans. You don't actually have to submit your W-2. You don't have to prove um, your income and the like. And you can get a loan at a, at a somewhat higher rate. Home equity loans are an important component of that market. And then there are the, the government programs, FHA and, and VA for veterans and very, very low income households. That market got really, really big. Between 2004 and 2007, we issued $5.3 trillion of non-prime loans, 5.3 trillion. In the flow of funds from the Federal Reserve, first quarter of 2008, there was 10.6 trillion of home mortgages outstanding in, from, for the household sector. So this became a very large market. And in 2006, for the first time, subprime loan volume exceeded conventional and conforming loan volume in the United States. In a normal year, that ratio would be 10 to, it would be, you know, one-tenth to one-fifth of, of the, the prime market. As, as it were. So we greatly expanded the pool of, of owners. We made very high loan to value loans with all types of exotic terms and the like. So we levered up um, with high risk households. Um, we overbuilt the housing market. Ultimately, the bubble burst. And what we got, um, as of now, foreclosures 0.83, these are numbers from a mortgage banker survey, which is a really good one. 0.83% um, of mortgages in their sample nationally are in foreclosure. And by that I mean they're past delinquent and it's basically the bank wants the house. So a little less than one in 100. 5.8% um, are delinquent at least 30 days. You know, one in 20 rounding. If you go to the subprime pool subsample, 20%, um, one in five of those loans is delinquent. 5.3% um, are in foreclosure, where again, colloquially, I'm defining that as you, you haven't paid enough, the bank would like the home. Thank you very much. So, you know, about one in 20 of, of those borrowers. How did this spiral down over the abyss where it could kill great firms? Like you said, they survived the Great Depression, which strikes me as a little worse than, than what's happening right now. Um, partly, it's because the underlying problem um, always kept getting worse, and you can see it in the loan vintage data. And I'll, I'll give you three snapshots of, of data for you. Um, now I'm into sort of 60-day delinquent subprime loans, so people who got loans with somewhat impaired credit. Historically, by the way, we've had a subprime market for 20 years. It's not entirely new. Um, it's, it, it grew enormously recently, but it's been around for a while. Um, and historically, subprime pool delinquency rates, 60-day plus delinquency rates, would peak at about 20% after two and a half to, to three years. Beginning in 2005, it became clear the underlying credit quality of these loans had deteriorated because the 2005 vintage loans peaked above 30% after two and a half years. 2006 vintage has not peaked. The latest data we have after 29 months is 42% of those guys are delinquent 60 days or more. The 2007 vintage is the worst by a wide margin, and that's saying something because it's 42% on 2006. Alt-A actually looks good, lower the numbers by about half on, on that. Um, the good news about this is there's no more Alt-A in subprime. There were under $5 billion of Alt-A and subprime securitizations in the first half of 2008. So that problem ultimately will go away because we're just not doing those, those loans anymore. At least you have to hold them on your balance sheet if you're going to issue them. You can't securitize them anymore. Um, so I think we're beginning to get a handle once we see how bad the 06 and 07 vintages are. People will be able to price. And my point here is as things kept deteriorating over time, people couldn't price these things, so they just started giving massive haircuts to the prices of these securities, and they ultimately became toxic. There was a buyer strike. No one wanted to own them. I suspect someone's going to make a decent amount of money um, buying some of these because, one, not everybody's going to default, and if they default, you still have recovery. You've actually got a house with a roof on it. You're going to recover some of the value when you sell it to someone. But the thing that I, I think really hurt um, Lehman and Hurt, Fannie and Freddie um, in the last month has been the, the surprising rise 
in the 60-day delinquency rate in the prime loan market. Okay? In the past, typically, the, after a three years of seasoning, less than one in 100 prime loans would be 60 days or more delinquent. Um, the 2005 and 2006 vintages were, were above that. Um, they peaked out at about 2%. And then the 2007 vintage is already at 2% delinquency through a year and a half. And there are a lot of prime loans, and that's really starting to scare people, and they're starting to connect it with the fall in house prices. There are two major house price series out there, the Case-Shiller indexes, um, which if you have not checked out the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you can download these just by you know, giving them your email, and they only modestly spam you after you've done that, so it's not too bad. Um, but you really want to look at those data. And then what used to be the OFEO index, the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight, which has a new name because there's a new regulator um, for Fannie and Freddie now. The, the Case-Shiller Index is the broader index. It includes subprime, Alt-A, and the like. U.S. housing prices in that index, which is what, what's called a repeat sales, and think of that as a constant quality of house index. They're pricing essentially the same home over time, down 15.4% in the last calendar year from second quarter of 07 to second quarter of 08. There's a lot of variance across markets. Some are only you know, modestly bad, Dallas and Charlotte in that index. Da Charlotte's down a point, Dallas down 3.2. Vegas, Miami, and Phoenix are all down at least 28% in that index. In the Ofeo index, things don't look nearly as dire. Again, remember, they don't have, they're not pricing changes in home, home values on subprime and Alt-A. It's only Fannie and Freddie conforming stuff. It's down 4.8% over the last year. Um, Dallas is actually up, so is Charlotte in that index. But Vegas, Miami, and Phoenix are all down double digits. Um, Vegas leading the pack at 18% over the last year. Those are just unprecedented nominal price drops. And I think the people pricing these securities are starting to wonder if it's not just a subprime and alt-A problem where we lent to people we shouldn't have lent to, but folks who played by the rules, who put down 10 or 20 percent, are now in a position where they've lost their equity and they're thinking, do I really want to pay this, this loan off? And I think that's really starting to scare people um, in, the, in, in the business. And it's, it's causing a real, it, it, it made those securities toxic, basically, so that there was a buyer strike. And basically, there isn't a price at which people want to hold those things anymore. Looking forward, um, I, I think we're not out of the water, as you know. There'll be a lot of geographic heterogeneity. I think the commodity farm and energy belts of the United States are going to do pretty well um, over the next couple of years. Ultimately, Florida, Las Vegas, Phoenix, the Inland Empire of California will grow their way out of this problem. People still want to live there. They still want to work there. Um, and when housing prices fall enough, and they are going to fall a decent amount more, I think, um, those, those problems will get cured, but it's not an 09 solution by any means in, in my view. The other thing is I don't think there'll be pricing power in the long run. One of the reasons is mortgage lock-in. It turns out most people who go negative on their house, they have negative equity, they don't actually default. They just stay in their home. They're locked in. To move, they would have to put up cash to cure you know, the, 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 the negative equity, and they can't, they're liquidity constrained. So transactions volumes in this market are going to be low for a number of years. Um, and I think there's just not going to be a, a, lot of, a lot of pricing power. The wild card, of course, is recession and how bad that gets. Real quickly, Fannie and Freddie. Um, I want to raise the issue with you and hope you start thinking about what are we going to do with these guys. Um, first, to describe them, for those of you who don't know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are government-sponsored enterprises, um, which have provided liquidity to the housing market, and they are huge. This was Fannie's balance sheet um, and owner and assets in the first quarter of 2008 before things crashed um, very recently. $39 billion in equity. $761 billion in debt, of which a quarter trillion came due within a year. Um, they held on their balance sheet $737 billion in mortgages in 08 first quarter, and they had $2.5 trillion in mortgage guarantees. So they basically had a $3 trillion book and less than $40 billion in equity, 
and they were playing the yield curve. They were, you know, taking out short-term money um, and, and lending long. Freddie was just the mirror image, except, believe it or not, even worse capitalized and, and worse run. So they went broke. Um, they went broke because things started to default. People started to reprice these securities. And it turns out Fannie and Freddie own a lot more than conforming loans. They have affordable housing goals. And the United States government for a long time has run its affordable housing program off balance sheet to, to a very large extent through Fannie and Freddie. And this is the dangerous thing. It, it's what got us in trouble. Um, Fannie and Freddie own hundreds of billions of dollars of this subprime and Alt-A stuff. And it, it's in service of their affordable housing goals because those loans are basically made to low-income people or to people in what are called geographically underserved areas in the, in the legislation. Um, this is a really unwise structure for a couple of reasons. One, because in general we ought to run real programs on balance sheets so that we actually know what they cost. Um, and number two, Fannie and Freddie had an implicit guarantee which became explicit last week, at least their debt um, guarantee became explicit. So the incentives for management to take all types of crazy risks were, were right there. They were playing with the house's money, um, and they, they certainly did. And as we're going to find out, they, they lost it, as it were. Um, it's going to be a huge cost, but down the road, I think it's really important for all of us. It's a multi-trillion dollar problem where I think the underlying, the real costs are going to exceed 100 billion bucks, which is a lot of money, even by government standards, um, in, in the future. And we got to rethink, how are we going to help our least fortunate citizens in terms of housing consumption? And how are we going to align incentives at these agencies, which carry really great systemic risk? And to me, the scariest thing I saw in the last couple of weeks was those guys going under and international banks refusing to buy their debt. I will leave the commercial stuff. That's enough depressing stuff. We'll leave it to the Q&A, but that's eh, the nominal commercial real estate prices over the last six years doubled. If, if you've got a good reason why real estate became so productive, you're not worried. If you don't have a good reason, yes, this is starting to smell like housing.